In a guardhouse in southern Russia, two men in Red Army uniforms talked casually to each other in German. A third man, wearing the uniform of a German combat engineer, listened in closely. They were men of the Brandenburg Regiment, an elite German special forces unit that often dressed in enemy uniform to carry out its missions. They had just prevented Russian engineers from destroying the dam on the river Manich. They thought the operation had been successfully completed, but suddenly a stranger appeared in the doorway. Unknown soldier blew up the Vesilovskoye Reservoir Dam on the 27th of July 1942. It caused a sudden and dramatic rise in the water level downriver and placed a major obstacle in the path of the German advance. The river Manich had been transformed from a 40 meter wide river to a huge lake four kilometers across. German tanks that would have driven straight across the dam, now had to be ferried across the lake one by one. It bought some much needed time for the retreating Red Army. But this was only a small local victory. Three days previously, German Army Group A had captured Rostov-on-Don, the gateway to the Caucasus. The main German attack came from that direction, further to the west. The only good news was that the German 4th Panzer Army would soon be redirected from the Caucasus to support the attack on Stalingrad. The same day the dam was blown, Stalin received a report from the commander of the North Caucasus Front, Marshal Semyon Mikhailovich Budyonyi. He recommended an immediate withdrawal of his forces to the line of the Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains. After the recent Soviet defeats in the Crimea, at Kharkov, and in the Donbas, the Germans possessed a significant numerical advantage over the Soviets in the Caucasus. But Yonyi believed the only way to stabilize the situation was an immediate withdrawal south. The next day, Stalin signed the famous Order Number 227, not a step back. At the same time, he approved Budyonyi's plan of retreat. It seemed a contradiction, but in the Caucasus, military logic dictated just one course of action. The Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains comprised a formidable natural defense. The troops would withdraw to this line immediately before the Germans could encircle and destroy them. All Soviet reserves were being sent to help defend Stalingrad, where one of the decisive battles of the war was unfolding. There were no troops to spare for the North Caucasus Front, and so Budyonyi's troops began to dig in along the Terek. The great German summer offensive of 1942 was underway. Army Group B was advancing on Stalingrad, from where it could protect the northern flank of Army Group A, bound for the Soviet oil fields of the Caucasus. Before the war, 70% of all Soviet oil came from the Baku oil fields of the Caucasus. About a quarter came from the area around Grozny and Makop. Their capture would be a disaster and leave the Red Army without fuel. Hitler believed the war would be decided by the control of oil supplies. He was obsessed by oil and had even studied how it was drilled and refined. As Case Blue began, Army Group A breached Soviet defenses and began a rapid advance towards these vital oil fields. 
von Kleist's first Panzer Army led the way. In 1941, von Kleist had commanded the first Panzer Group in Ukraine. In the first week of the war, he had won a giant four-day tank battle at Brody. Now, he had been entrusted with the capture of the Caucasus oil fields. Marshal Budyonyi, by contrast, had experienced only defeat. Now, he oversaw his forces' retreat to the mountains. The Caucasus Mountains stretch 1,300 kilometers from the Caspian to the Black Sea. The range is divided into three parts. The Eastern Caucasus runs from the Abshiron Peninsula to Mount Kazbek, the Central Caucasus from Kazbek to Mount Elbrus, and the Western Caucasus from Elbrus to Anapa. Snow and ice cover the highest peaks all year round, and to reach Grozny, one must also cross the fast-flowing Terek River. Von Kleist planned to advance straight to Odzonokidze and follow the old Georgian military road straight to Tbilisi. He would ignore the mountain passes of the Western Caucasus in order to concentrate his forces. But Hitler rejected this plan, and the 49th Mountain Corps was diverted to the Western Caucasus. Hitler was adding another objective to Army Group A's ambitious list of goals. He now also demanded the capture of Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea coast. But Yonyi had very few tanks at his disposal. But because of his static positions, he did have the advantage in heavy artillery. He was also supported by powerful air units. The summer of 1942 saw an important change in the organization of the Red Army Air Force. Air armies were now assigned to Red Army fronts. It was a similar system to the one used by the Luftwaffe. It meant Air Force command was now more centralized, allowing concerted action. Previously, Soviet air units had been parceled out into small, ineffective formations. Soviet air strength in the Caucasus comprised the naval aviation of the Black Sea Fleet, the 5th Air Army under Lieutenant General Guryenov, and the 4th Air Army under Major General Vashinin. Konstantin Andreevich Vashinin began his military career in the infantry during the Russian Civil War. He only learned to fly in his 30s after he was transferred to the Air Force Academy. Initially, he wasn't enthusiastic about the Air Force, but his infantry background helped him to appreciate how air power could be used to support ground troops. In August 1942, the survival of Budyonyi's front depended on Vashinin's pilots. They constantly harried the advancing German columns with bombs and rockets. The Air Force was also the eyes of the retreating Red Army. Reconnaissance aircraft tracked the southern progress of von Kleist's Panzer Army. Following in the footsteps of the retreating Soviet troops came soldiers of the German 1st and 4th Mountain Divisions. Wir müssen diesen Berg besteigen. Da Abend sind wir da. Geht alle hinter andere. Folgt mir. Gehen wir. These men were mountain warfare specialists from the Austrian Tyrol and the Bavarian Alps. They traveled with climbing gear, pack animals, and specialized equipment, including lightweight artillery that could be disassembled and carried in sections on the backs of mules. The mountain infantry were ordered to fight their way through the mountain passes west of Elbrus and advance on Tbilisi. They only had a few weeks to get through the mountains before winter weather made them impassable. If they did break through, here and to the west, 
They could also capture the last Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea. The local Soviet commanders believed the mountains posed such a formidable obstacle that the passes only needed to be held by small detachments. But they had not counted on the expertise of the German mountain divisions. The German mountain troops began their advance through the Western Caucasus Mountains on the 15th of August. They planned a bold flanking movement of the Klukov Pass. Two squads armed with machine guns and mortars climbed for hours. The Soviet defenders suddenly found the enemy was behind them. Poor communications added to the crisis. Soviet headquarters only found out about the battle two days after it happened. Reserves were immediately sent in, including NKVD troops and cadets from the Sukumi Military Academy. The Stavka High Command radioed an urgent warning. The enemy has specially trained mountain troops and will use every road and path in the Caucasus Mountains to reach the South Caucasus. Commanders who believe the mountains to be an impassable obstacle are gravely mistaken. Only a skillfully prepared and well-defended line is impassable. But the warning had come too late for the defenders of the Klukov Pass. Soviet reserves reached the Klukov Pass a week after the initial attack. By then, the Germans were already on the southern slopes. Though they were prevented from advancing any further, they could not be dislodged. The Germans, meanwhile, had sent a detachment to Mount Elbrus, the highest peak in the Caucasus. On the 18th of August, they reached the refuge of 11 tourist camp. At 4,130 metres above sea level, the Refuge of Eleven has been described as the highest hotel in the world. The first wooden shelter was erected in 1932. Six years later, a three-storey shelter, coated in metal and resembling an airship, was built in its place. From this shelter, the Germans set off for the summit. On the 21st of August, soldiers of the German 1st Mountain Division raised the swastika flag over Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. It was a propaganda triumph, though Hitler himself was said to have been furious at what he regarded as a mere stunt. Meanwhile, in Moscow, events in the Caucasus were causing serious alarm. The feared head of the NKVD secret police, Lavrenti Beria, flew personally to Sukumi, his hometown, and sacked the commander of the 46th Army, General Sagatskov. In the eastern Caucasus, von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army had secured a toehold across the Terek River. But they encountered fierce resistance from Soviet units, which contained many local men who knew the mountains like the palm of their hand. Artillery observers on the high ground were able to direct accurate fire from Katyusha's and Howitzer's onto German pontoons across the Terek. The Germans were also confronted with a novel form of anti-tank barrier. Soviet soldiers filled ditches with oil, then set fire to them with flamethrowers. It created an impenetrable wall of fire and thick, noxious black smoke. <laughs> 
villages in the area of Malgebek changed hands several times. It was not until the Germans secretly moved the 13th Panzer Division south across the Terek that they were able to secure the area. They were reinforced by the SS Motorized Division, Viking. On the 27th of September, the Germans captured El Kertovo, but were forced back onto the defensive the very next day. Meanwhile, Luftwaffe units in the Caucasus had been sent north to Stalingrad, giving the Soviet Air Force a free hand. Vashinin's aircraft targeted the German pontoon bridges across the Terek. Vashinin always emphasized to his men the importance of supporting the ground forces. We exist for them, he told his pilots, not the other way around. It was difficult to get tanks from factories in Russia to the troops in the Caucasus. But one of the Allied Lend-Lease supply routes came up through the Caucasus from Iran. As a result, many Soviet tanks on this front were British and American models. By October 1942, the Caucasus front had a total of 300 tanks. British and American types made up 42%. T-34 medium tanks made up 20%, and heavy KV tanks just 2%. The remaining 36% were various types of Soviet light tank. The American M3 Stuart and the British Valentine were inferior to the T-34 and most German tanks. But they were an improvement on the Soviet light tanks, such as the T-26 and the BT-7, which were poorly armoured and seriously undergunned. Vashinin's 4th Air Army also received Lend-Lease equipment. Its pilots were among the first to master the American twin-engine Boston bomber. They particularly liked its navigational instruments, which made it safer than most aircraft to fly through the mountains in unpredictable weather. Another aircraft that thrived in the mountains was the I-153 Seagull biplane. Low speeds and superb maneuverability made it an effective fighter bomber amid the ravines and passes. Rocket attacks by low-flying seagulls were a common sight in these high-altitude battles. On the ground, special NKVD units with Alpine training had been formed. They carried the fight back to the Germans with their own deep outflanking maneuvers. Their gear was a strange mix of pre war sportswear, military uniform, and captured German kit. Painstaking reconnaissance was the bedrock of these units' operations. In early September, one of these units was able to turn the tables on the Germans in the Klukov Pass, the scene of their earlier defeat. Soviet mountain troops spotted a long caravan of German soldiers and pack animals heading up to the pass. They were a long way off, beyond rifle range. Just then, three aircraft marked with the Red Star zoomed overhead. Gusev, a section commander of engineers, described what happened. Our pilots weren't only skilled, they also knew the mountains. First, they attacked the convoy itself, but the results weren't great. So then they bombed the slopes above the road. Huge, great stone blocks fell down towards Hitler's convoy. The slope disappeared in a thick cloud of dust, and when it cleared, 
he saw the convoy had been devastated. By September 1942, a stalemate had been reached in the mountain passes of the Caucasus. German mountain infantry couldn't build on their initial success and break through to the coast. But nor were Soviet forces strong enough to recapture the high passes they lost in August. On the 28th of September, one of the most unusual battles of the Second World War took place at more than 4,000 metres above sea level. The Soviets had formed a special NKVD detachment, about 100 strong, to recapture the refuge of the Eleven near the summit of Mount Elbrus. They were led by Lieutenant Gregorians and armed with machine guns, mortars and sniper rifles. The German mountain troops were stunned by the audacity of the attack, but they quickly rallied. Machine gun fire echoed across the mountains for several hours. Slowly, the tide of battle turned against Lieutenant Gregorians and his men. Only four men from his detachment made it back alive. The lieutenant's body was one of many that littered the mountain slope. A few days later, the temperature in the mountains plummeted. Soon, both sides were losing more men to frostbite and avalanches than they did from combat. It was impossible to fight in such conditions. There would be no German breakthrough in the mountains in 1942. In the Caucasus, the Germans found some support from nationalists and anti-communists amongst the local population. The strong history of nationalism in the Caucasus made it fertile recruiting ground for the Wehrmacht. They had captured many conscripts from Georgia, Chechnya, Armenia and Azerbaijan, some of whom were prepared to fight against the Soviet Union. They were formed into the so-called Eastern Legions but many of these units turned out to be deeply unreliable. In October, the 23rd Panzer Division was informed that a battalion of Georgian volunteers planned to go over to the Soviet side. The Germans immediately made arrangements to disarm the unit and take it off the front line. After a shootout with the Germans, some of the Georgians did manage to slip over to the Soviet lines. The episode was symptomatic of the variable military worth of the Eastern Legions. The German bridgehead across the Terek River was of continuing concern to the Soviet Front Command. In November, it was decided to eliminate this foothold with an overwhelming infantry and tank assault. But before it could begin, 
Von Kleist, using the last of his fuel and ammunition reserves, launched his own assault. He had decided to try and fight his way through to Ordzunikidze along a new route, which lay through the towns of Baksan and Nalchik. Tanks of the 1st Panzer Army, supported by airstrikes, made a rapid advance. The Germans, it seemed, had rediscovered the Blitzkrieg spirit. Soon they had reached the outskirts of Ordzonikidze, but their success was short-lived. Forces from the South Caucasus Front were sent to crush the Terek bridgehead. Two German panzer divisions were surrounded near the village of Gizel. The Germans were forced to abandon their vehicles and heavy weapons and fight their way out on foot. For the Germans, reaching Tbilisi was now out of the question. In 2007, President Putin would award both Malgobek and Ordzunikidze, today known as Vladikavkaz, the title of City of Military Glory for their wartime heroism. In November, the encirclement of 6th Army at Stalingrad turned the campaign on its head. If the Germans did not immediately evacuate the Caucasus, the Red Army might reach Rostov and cut off the entire Army Group A. On the 22nd of November, von Kleist was promoted to command of Army Group A. He immediately ordered the 1st Panzer Army to withdraw to Rostov, while 17th Army retreated to the Kuban bridgehead. The only way to keep the Kuban bridgehead supplied was by air. It would have been impossible if 6th Army had still been holding out at Stalingrad. But their surrender freed up enough Luftwaffe transport aircraft to establish an air bridge to Kuban. On the 13th of March, Army Group A received new orders from the Army High Command. Hold the Kuban bridgehead and the Crimea at all costs. Von Kleist made his own report to the Army High Command about the value of the Kuban bridgehead. Advantages of the position. A considerable number of Russian forces are tied up. The enemy Black Sea Fleet is unable to conduct offensive operations. The defense of the Crimea is facilitated. In the spring of 1943, most of the Eastern Front was quiet as both sides geared up for the Battle of Kursk. But at Kuban, the fighting rumbled on. The Shinin ordered the construction of an Air Force command post near the front line. The battlefield was small here. Air raids and fighter patrols could be observed from the ground and information relayed back to the squadrons. Dogfights above the Kuban bridgehead frequently involved 30 to 40 aircraft on each side. Vashinin had demanded that his fighters keep enemy bombers away from their infantry lines at all costs. The air battle over Kuban became one of the most famous of the Eastern Front. Under unrelenting pressure from the Red Army, the Kuban bridgehead finally began to buckle in August 1943. The Germans were outflanked by Soviet advances to the north and by amphibious landings at Novorossiysk. 
In October, the 17th Army was evacuated to the Crimea. Hitler's quest for oil had proved to be a disaster. A Soviet artillery officer studied enemy positions on the Perikop Isthmus, the gateway to the Crimea. He was looking for targets for the 280 millimeter mortars. Their 200 kilogram shells could smash through the thickest of walls. Preparations for the Crimea offensive were underway. The Red Army's advance through Ukraine had isolated German and Romanian forces in the peninsula. But only three narrow strips of land connect the Crimea to the mainland. At Perikop, the isthmus is just 14 kilometers wide. There would be no room to maneuver. German and Romanian troops of the 17th Army had had five months to fortify the Perikop Isthmus. Machine gun crews stood ready to mow down advancing Soviet infantry. Howitzers were hidden in the valleys. Romanian dictator Marshal Antonescu wanted Hitler to evacuate the Crimea, where seven Romanian divisions were stationed. But the Fuhrer feared the Soviets would use Crimean airfields to bomb the Romanian oil fields. Germany's chrome supplies from Turkey would also be threatened. Admiral Dönitz assured Hitler that if required, the Navy could evacuate 17th Army by sea. But he was counting on the Germans holding on to the port of Odessa. And on the 10th of April 1944, Odessa fell to the Red Army. Ten days earlier, Hitler had fired von Kleist from command of Army Group A. His replacement was Colonel General Ferdinand Schoener. After arriving in the Crimea, Schoener reported back to Hitler, telling him the situation was stable and the Crimea could hold out for many months. On the 8th of April 1944, at Perikop, Sivash and Kerch, the Soviet guns roared into life. Timber gun emplacements were turned into matchwood. Buildings were reduced to rubble. Finally, uniformed men sprang up from the Red Army trenches. Shouts of Ura, the Russian battle cry, could be heard, and the squeal of tank tracks. The Germans raced from their dugouts to their fighting positions. Concealed guns opened fire. It was an old trick. A Soviet forward artillery observer was meticulously noting the muzzle flashes and sending their coordinates back to the batteries by telephone. <laughs> Soviet artillery pummeled the German positions that had just given themselves away. The dummies were cut to ribbons, but they had served their purpose. Now the soldiers took them down and prepared for the real attack. They were supported by T-34s of the Second Guards Army. Amongst them, the feared OT-34 flamethrower tanks. 
the Red Army onslaught proved irresistible. The assault was supported by amphibious landings that outflanked the German defences at Perikop. The commander of the 17th Army, General Janneke, received permission to retreat. The Germans began a swift withdrawal towards Sevastopol, where Hitler expected them to hold out for many months, as the Soviets had in 1942. The evacuation of German and Romanian troops from Sevastopol began. The transports would be highly exposed. But after losing a battleship and two destroyers to air attack the previous year, the Stavka ordered the big ships of the Black Sea Fleet to stay out of range of the Luftwaffe. Soviet submarines had also suffered heavy losses. It would primarily fall to the Air Force to prevent the evacuation. By 1944, Navy pilots of the Black Sea Fleet had mastered a lethal new form of attack. It was known as skip bombing. Skip bombing attacks had to be made at high speed and low altitude. When the bomb was released, it would skip like a pebble across the surface of a lake and strike the side of the ship. Meanwhile, the pilot climbed hard to avoid the ship's superstructure. Skip bombing had several advantages over aerial torpedo attacks. Firstly, it was effective against ships with very shallow drafts, like landing craft. Secondly, a ship could spot a torpedo and dodge it with evasive action. But the bomb was on them in just seconds. Thirdly, torpedoes were expensive and in high demand. By comparison, bombs were plentiful and cheap. Boston bombers proved the most effective skip bombers, but the new tactic was also successfully employed by Lavoshkin 5 fighters, Ilyushin 2s and Ilyushin 4s. Units of the 4th Ukrainian Front pursued the enemy to the gates of Sevastopol. The heavy artillery was brought up in preparation for a long siege. On the 5th of May 1944, after a 90-minute barrage, the Soviet infantry began their assault. In 1941, the Red Army had held Sevastopol for nine months against the Germans. But this time, it would not be such a drawn-out affair. Sevastopol's northern shore fell to the Red Army within three days, putting the harbour in range of Soviet artillery. German ships arriving from the Romanian port of Constanta had to run a gauntlet of air attacks and shelling at the landing stages. Admiral Ojebrisky, commander of the Black Sea Fleet, requested permission to send his cruisers to attack the German and Romanian transports. But the Stavka refused. The big warships were not to be exposed to air attack. This was a job for the submarines and the Air Force. In the small hours of the 10th of May, the German transport ships Tortilla and Teja arrived off Sevastopol. It was too dangerous for them to approach the harbour, so the ships anchored two miles offshore, while 10,000 soldiers were ferried out to them in assault boats from the southwestern docks of Kiersonis. As the embarkation was underway, more than 20 Ilyushin II Sturmoviks appeared overhead. The Tortilla was hit by three bombs and sank in minutes. The second transport, Teja, weighed anchor and headed for the open sea, but the Soviet Air Force soon caught up with her. 
The Taya was hit by no fewer than six 100 kilogram bombs. She lost steering and engine power before 11 Boston bombers arrived to finish her off. Two bombs hit the Taya near the waterline. These were the fatal blows. The loss of both transports cost up to 8,000 lives. These were by far the greatest losses of the evacuation. In all, about two-thirds of 17th Army was evacuated, including its commander, General Elmendinger, who reached Constanta by torpedo boat on the night of the 11th. General Hartmann was left in charge at Sevastopol, but without heavy weapons, there was no chance of holding off the Red Army for more than a few hours. The remnants of 17th Army were overrun the next day, the 12th of May, 1944. British war correspondent Alexander Worth visited Sebastopol when the fighting was over. Around Kasonis it was gruesome. All the area in front of the earthworks and beyond was ploughed up by thousands of shells and scorched by the fire of Katyushas. The ground was littered with thousands of German helmets, rifles, bayonets and other arms and ammunition. Nearly all the dead had been buried but around the shattered lighthouse, dead Germans and rafts were bobbing in the water. The German 17th Army had been effectively destroyed in the Crimea. In the month-long campaign, it had suffered nearly 70,000 men killed or captured. Soviet dead and captured totaled approximately 18,000. The Wehrmacht was suffering a series of devastating defeats on the Eastern Front. After his dismissal by Hitler, Field Marshal von Kleist went into enforced retirement. At the end of the war, he was arrested by the Americans and later extradited to Yugoslavia. There, he was sentenced to 15 years for war crimes. But he was also wanted in the Soviet Union. In 1948, Marshal Tito agreed to extradite von Kleist to the USSR. In 1952, the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSR sentenced him to 25 years. Von Kleist died in a Soviet prisoner of war camp from ill health two years later. After the liberation of the Crimea, the Fourth Air Army was sent to Belorussia. There, its squadrons would support Operation Bagration as the war in the East turned decisively against Nazi Germany. They would pursue the Wehrmacht across the battlefields of East Prussia and Pomerania and on to the very streets of Berlin. <laughs> 